Good to see the Lord's house today. Good to see this good crowd out on a, our first Wednesday night since time changed. Amen. It's, it, it's always kind of interesting to me. I was like, well, I'm going to see how everybody reacts. They're going to be worn out. I think they're all worn out because of a little bit of extra time. But uh, to be, for you to stop what you're doing and come to church and um, to be a part of this Bible study, I know God will bless that. And uh, I know many of you probably have many things you can continue to do and continue to work. So I'm so glad that uh, you came tonight. Uh, we're going to take prayer for this in just a moment. We're going to get back in the book of Romans chapter 15. Pick up where we left off last week. Uh, we finished our last time we were here. I, I was here. Um, we finished chapter 14. We'll begin in chapter 15. But if I'm honest tonight, I, I probably need to be down there, and I need somebody to be teaching me, amen, have y'all ever had one of those afternoons or one of those days where it was like, um, get thee behind me, Satan, um, I, but I was reminded of that post Mr. Cole posted this week with the cow hanging on the fence, he says, sometimes it's not the devil, it's your decisions, and I'm still trying to discern whether it was my decisions or the devil this afternoon that, uh, that gave me a, a bad afternoon, but I... I probably, I probably need somebody to be teaching me tonight. But y'all pray for me and pray for, uh, I'll continue to heal my pneumonia. I don't really think I had that. That's what they said I had. Uh, but I don't really think that's what I had. But I have been on some pretty high-powered um, antibiotics. So y'all pray that, uh, that they, they're okay and I don't, I don't get upset. So uh, anyway, uh, special prayer request. Let's remember Miss Katie. Um, Norton, she had surgery this morning. Uh, didn't get to go in until about 11 o'clock, but uh, she, everything went well. She was in recovery and probably, I'm not sure if she was staying overnight or not. She's on the way home. On the way home. Okay, so on the way home. Amen. Well, that's great. So she's on her way home doing well. She had hip replacement surgery today. So y'all continue to pray for Miss Katie Norton, and uh, she recovers from that. Um. Continue to remember the Dean Cates family. That was my aunt, Brother Ray. We buried her yesterday, and I know Brother Ray is. Uh, he, he's taking it pretty hard. Um, you don't. You don't. You're not married to somebody for 60 years and uh, not not feel a, a great loss when you lose your spouse. So please pray for him and his family. Um, there's many others that's lost loved ones lately. A um, lot of deaths right now. It seems like all over in different communities. Yes, ma'am. Beverly Thompson. Beverly Thompson, let's remember her. That's right. That's the one that I was trying to think. Miss uh, Sonia Wilson's mother was admitted today. That's where they're at. Yes. Okay. Let's remember that one. Pray for brother, brother Dalton. God's using him in a big way, man. Love to see a young man getting opportunities to preach like he does, and I appreciate that. Appreciate him. Also, remember brother Dusty tonight. So he'll be preaching revival at uh, in Liberty Baptist in Strasburg, Virginia, his dad's church, and he'll be um, finishing up revival tonight. So y'all pray for brother Dusty as we go to pray. They're probably getting ready to kick off service right about now too. So y'all remember that. Any others? Okay. Let's remember Brother Easton. He's had some 
um, a torn meniscus and having some infection there. So I'm glad he's got to come home and can be, can even remember him. Yes, Miss Olga. I want to say thank God for you. I want to ask you to remember him too because we are 25 year olds all starting 54 year old lives. <laughs> Amen. Let's remember us all when she takes that test. Amen. Okay. What's his name, Brother Will? Uh, Harris. 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 Harris Park. Let's remember him. Any others? New voters, I mean, you know, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> I can't say it again, amen. We'll get, we'll get kicked off Facebook tonight. <laughs> we do need to pray for our country, though. Pray, pray that, uh, I mean, we enter into a new election cycle. Y'all know how crazy it's been the last few we've had. It's going to be even crazier this year. Um, but remember this, no matter what, I know it's been said a hundred times, you heard it all the last cycle. No matter who the president is, he, we still know who's on the throne. Amen. And he's in control of everything. And uh, I, I know a lot of people say this, the world's falling apart. And it feels like that. But really it's falling right into place. Exactly how God wants it to go. Uh, he's not surprised by any of this. And we're just got to trust him through it all. And uh, there might be some times, though, where we've been pretty insulated from suffering, from things that go on all over the world. We, the United States, have been pretty insulated from that for most of its life, for most of its uh, existence. And uh, I'm afraid we're going to have to experience some of that coming up uh, as Christians, as just Americans. We're going to experience some hardships. But just trust in the Lord and continue to look for him, walk with him, draw closer to him, and uh, we'll be okay. <coughs> yes, Miss Olga. Just pray. Amen. 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 Continue to pray for Israel, too. Please pray, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Pray for those people over there. Pray for our Jewish missionaries um, that we that we had here not too long ago during our uh, mission conference. And I'm going to get him back one Sunday morning so everybody can get it. He was fantastic. I mean, absolutely fantastic. But y'all pray for them. 
Also pray for Brother John Alves. He will be coming back here uh, the end of June, making another trip to America, and he'll be traveling, trying to raise more support. But he told me, he said this time, I felt so bad last time for not coming to Ephesus first, but now it's my home church in America. Amen. So uh, I will be here there first. So uh, hope he's just going to come go to church with us that day. We, I, I don't, he gets preached to death when he gets here. We, I just want to have a day where he can sit back and be ministered to and let us throw a, a meal for him. But he'll be here at the end of June. But y'all pray. He, 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 we talk daily. And uh, he asked me to pray for their provision. Uh, let's pray for that. Pray for Miss Savannah's allergies. She's having some issues with allergies. And uh, for God's presence in his life. That was the three things he asked me to pray for last night. <laughs> Y'all pray for those, especially with Brother John. All right, any others tonight? Oh, yes, Miss Miss Tanya um, Sturger. Yes, let's remember her. She's, she um, has that, that cancer. Let's continue that. And let me say this. They did get to do the... The eternity is too long to be wrong. Books last week uh, at Sardis, and they actually ended up doing twenty thousand. Amen. So they did their ten thousand plus the ten thousand we were planning to do. So we're thankful for that. All right. Any others tonight? Yes, Miss April. Carrie Mallory. Let's remember. Remember that one. Any others? Let's go to the Lord in prayer, asking to touch our service and all these requests that's been made tonight. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we come to you tonight as humbly as we know how. Father, Lord, we just we come to you with thankful hearts. Lord, I'm thankful that I can come to you and, Lord, just have fellowship with you. Lord, I need you tonight, God, and I need your fellowship restored. And God, I pray that you forgive me for I failed you, Lord, this day. Lord, you, I pray that you would just help me to be filled with your spirit, God. And Lord, just help me to, 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 to be cleansed and make me a vessel, Lord, that you're able to use and willing to use tonight to teach your people. God, I pray for every request that's been made. I thank you, Lord, that, Lord, you know every one. Lord, you forget not one. Lord, you know the need behind every request that's been made, and you have the power to touch them. You have the power to, to heal you have the power to give comfort, Lord. You have the power, Lord, to, to protect. You have the power to everything that's been asked tonight. We pray that you do it according to your rich mercy and power and grace. God, be with us tonight as we study this lesson. Let it be a, a, a help to us. Let us draw closer to you that we might walk closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, Romans chapter 15, we're going to read just a few verses in just a moment, but I want to give you just a little recap about what we talked about in chapter 14. Uh, remember, let, let, me, let me just go back and give you the whole recap of the book of Romans. The book of Romans began, uh, Paul talked about how every person had sinned, that there was none good, no, not one, and we had all come short of the glory of God, and we would all stand condemned before God so that... No person, no one could claim that they were worthy or good enough to get into heaven on their own account, that we all stand condemned before God. But then he said, but God has sent, made a plan. He sent his son, Jesus, that died on the cross. And he, he, he said, by Jesus and through his blood, we are justified and cleansed of our sins. We can have justification. And then he talked about how after we're justified, that we are then sanctified. That means we're set apart. Uh, for his use and for his glory. And then we draw closer to him every day. He talked about that. And then he began to talk about how there's no condemnation in us in, uh, in, in chapter 8. And through Jesus Christ, because we know them, listen, the devil can accuse us all he wants. Amen. He is the accuser of the brethren, but he cannot condemn us. Amen. We are, there is therefore now no condemnation to them that walk in the spirit. Uh, so he can't condemn us because we've been saved by the grace of God. After he talked about that, he began to talk about the Jews and how they uh, rejected Jesus when he came, how they were rejected. And they, he, the Bible says that he came into his own and his own received him not. So they rejected him. And because they rejected him, Paul, uh, Paul then talked about how that God sent out the, the, the gospel to the Gentiles 
and uh, they, they were, uh, there's going to be a restoration of the Jews as well. There was a rejection, and uh, the, then there will be a, resurrect, uh, a restoration in chapter 11. Then he began to talk about how, after, in beginning in chapter 12, how we are to live. Now, this is very practical for us. This is how we are to live as Christians, how we are to conduct ourselves as Christians. And he began to, to talk about that. Ver chapter 14 last week, he says, uh, let, let, me, let me just go back. Verse 1, him that is weak in faith receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. In other words, he was saying, listen, there's some weak folks. And can we say this today? Everybody's in a different walk in their, their Christian maturity, right? We're all in different stages. Nobody, everybody's not the same. Brother Dalton, everybody's not a mature Christian yet. There's mature Christians, they're immature Christians. Those that just got born again, they're, they're just immature. They're like babes in Christ because they just don't know anything. They don't, it's not, it's not, a, it's not their fault. It's not a, a negative against them. They just don't know yet. So they're not as mature as somebody that may have been walking with the Lord for some time. Uh, there's just different maturity levels throughout all the things. But he said there's some that are weak and some that are strong. He said receive them this week, and, but not to doubtful disputations. And what that means is, he says, there's going to be some things in a church group or a group of believers that everybody's not going to agree on. Can I say this? If it's spelled out plainly in this book, there ain't no disputation about it, Okay. You may have a different of opinion on it, but if it's in this book, your opinion's wrong, amen? If it's spelled out plainly in this book, then this book is right, you're wrong. But there's other things that we, that's not really spelled out plainly in Scripture. This just kind of up to, to, I guess it would, we, I called it gray areas that week. It's just areas that's not spelled out plainly in the Bible. So what we are we to do then? Paul said this, follow your convictions. However you're convicted, whatever your convictions are, follow them. But, he said now, let me wait, let me say this, follow your convictions unless the liberty that you have in Christ, and we talked about different things, different things, and what the thing that Paul brought up was there were some people that were deciding or that they didn't eat meat at all, because that meat may have been sacrificed to a pagan god. And then they would take that meat after they sacrificed it, go down to the meat market and sell it. And there would be some Christians that saw nothing wrong with that meat. It was cheap. It was available. They could go buy that for their family, feed their family. But there were other people that said, oh, I can't believe you would eat that meat. That's been offered to an idol. And uh, that's off limits to Christians. Well, the Bible doesn't really clearly plain, spell that out, that it's off limits. It's just a point of conviction. But he said if someone is convicted by that and they are not to eat uh, meat, he said, receive them. But don't argue about that thing that's, that's kind of up in the air that you don't know about. But he said this, and if you got liberty, if God gives you liberty to eat that steak while your brethren is a, is a vegetarian and over there eating Brussels sprouts and, and asparagus and all that, he said... Uh, that's fine, you can eat a steak and not even feel bad about it. But he said, but if it's going to cause your brother to stumble, don't eat a steak in front of him. He said, get it to go, take it home, eat your steak in, in public. Don't cause your brother to stumble by liberties that you may feel like you have. So if somebody, if something that you're doing that you feel like you have a Christian liberty to do because it's not spelled out in the Bible, if it offends a brother, he said, don't do it in front of that brother. Don't offend them. Don't cause them to stumble. Uh, but he did say this. He said those that are offended and don't do it, he called those the weaker brethren in there. They were weaker in faith. It was just a maturity level. So now Paul moves on in chapter 15 and says this. We then that are strong are to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Paul's going to change gears here. He's still going to be talking about the, the, the Christian liberties that we have and the things that, that uh, God doesn't really spell out plainly in the Bible. But he says this, then we then are weak ought to bear the infirmities, or we then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak. In other words, he said, you mature Christians, you understand that it, it, you're further enough along in your, in your walk with God that you can, 
you cannot be offended by these things and you understand that God loves you and there's no condemnation in you and you have the liberty to do some things and you don't feel conviction about that, you can do that. He said, that's fine, but he said, for your brother and sister that is not as strong or not as mature as you, then you are to help them along and help bear their, uh, their infirmities. In other words, help bear their burdens. Help them to grow. Do y'all realize that church ain't just about you? Yeah. Church ain't just about you. How many of have you ever made this statement? Well, I hope the preachers got something good today because um, I really need something today. Well, maybe it's not about you that day. Do you realize every time you come in here, it ain't going to be about you. The preacher's not going to be preaching to you. The preacher may be preaching to somebody else that needs that. And, and, and it's not all about us. So, so many times we get so self-absorbed as Christians, we think that every church service is about us. It's not. It's about him. Amen. It's all about him. And God will speak to different individuals. But we are, as believers in Christ, are to come looking to help somebody else. That's what church is about. It's about looking to help somebody else. If I don't get help today and God doesn't speak to me, then maybe I, God wants me to help somebody else. Let me give you an example. Y'all remember the story in the Bible of when Jesus uh, fed the 5,000? And there was a little lad, a little boy that had uh, two fishes and five loaves. And Jesus looked out and said, hey, is there anybody got anything that we can help feed these people? And they said, Jesus, it'll take a truckload of bread to feed all these folks. And they said, the only thing we can find is a little boy here that's got two fishes and five loaves. And Jesus said, let me have it. I'm going to feed this 5,000. And uh, they were like, oh, Jesus, you're really going to do that. But do you realize what that little boy did that day? He came and was a blessing to everybody. It's amazing to me that out of 5,000 people, he was the only person that had anything that Jesus could use. He was the only one, Brother Dalton, that had anything that Jesus could, could turn or, or could multiply and feed those people. He brought something with him. Let me say this. How many times have you ever brought anything with you to church? Oh, so many times we come into church like an empty vessel. Oh, fill me. Maybe you need to get filled before you come to church so when you get to church, you can be that one that helps somebody. You're the one that may give that encouragement, not just the preacher. And listen, it's my place. Listen, I need to, I better be filled before I get here because that's my job. That's my calling. But it's also yours. It's also your calling that you may, it may be that you have something and somebody needs an encouragement, and you're able to walk by and just give them a word. And you're able to fill them up and give them something that, that's going to help them and encourage them on. So we need to help bear the infirmities. Those of us that are strong are to help bear the infirmities of the weak and look not to please ourselves. That's what he says. It ain't about pleasing us. It's about pleasing the Lord and helping other people. Uh, help that brethren. He says... Uh, we are to bear one another's burdens, is what he says in Galatians chapter 6. Amen? Bear one another's burdens. I'll give you another example of that. I remember uh, several years ago, we were heading to teen camp. And if anybody knows anything about farming, the middle of springtime to the first of, of uh, summertime, I'm talking about it, it, it is the craziest time of the year for us farmers right we're always busy we're trying to get crops uh, ready we're trying to cut hay we're trying to get grass fertilized we're trying to get our cows laid by we're trying to get our chickens done it's just a crazy time of the year and i tell you leading up to that church camp that year teen camp was in june i was i if they say burning the uh the candle at both ends it was done burn all the way up amen i mean i was about had it and I told Nicole, I didn't know how I was going to get everything done that I had to get done before we went. But somehow I got enough to get me by. And I remember as I pulled out in that driveway right there feeling just a, a ton of relief because I made it to that point was going there. But this is the problem. I was drained. I, I, I was not a cup that was filled ready to minister out of my overflow. Do you realize this? You can't minister out of an empty cup. What's that old song, Brother Larry? It's uh, uh, drinking out of my saucer or, or ministering out of your saucer. You got to drink. You, you got to minister out of your overflow. And I was an empty cup. 
going down there that day. Well, I got down there, and we got everybody unloaded, and I was sitting there, and I was just kind of leaned up against the wall. Man, I, I guess you could see it on my face. I guess you could just see the exasperation on me and in my life. Brother Lynn Janney walked up to me, and he could tell something was going on. And he didn't say anything. He didn't ask for, hey, are you okay? He just started pouring into me. He began to, uh, to, to just share things to me. And what he was doing, he was helping me. He was pouring into me. He wasn't there to please himself. He wasn't there to help himself. But he was, he was strong, and he was helped bearing that one that was weak, which was me at that time. And God says we, are, we have that opportunity to do that each and every day. That that's what, when we come to church, that's what we ought to do. We that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak, not to please ourselves. Look, listen to this. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. Does anybody know what edification means? To build up. That's exactly right. When you edify somebody, you build them up. What Brother Lee and Janie did to me down there that day was built me up. Amen. He encouraged me. He, he, he shared some wisdom with me. He built me up. And he says that we ought to bear the infirmities of the weak. But we let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. In other words, Paul says this, your duty as a Christian is to build up your neighbor, is to make your neighbor better, to pour into him, to, 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 to build him up, to help him, to, to disciple him. I guess that's really a good word for that is to disciple. We are to help to disciple one another and grow in faith. Brother Edward, Brother Edward has a real gift for helping edify people. He edifies me, amen. He builds me up. And I'm not talking about brags on me. I'm talking about shares some real good insight to me. But he, he does that to me. You do that to somebody else. You are to help somebody else. That's where that, that verse, iron sharpeneth iron, comes in. That's what we're doing. We're edifying one another and building one another up. He says, let every one of us do that to please his neighbor, not to please himself. Let me ask you this. How many times have you ever seen Christians that's all about getting what they want? Pleasing themselves. Self-absorbed Christians. It's all about what I want. I ain't worried about what nobody else wants. Listen, we need to really take heed of this because we're about to build a building. And there's going to be some things in that building that you're probably going to say, this is the way I want. There might be some things where I say, this is the way I want it. But you know what? I may not get my way. It may have to go another way. And I got to be where I'm like, it's okay. Because I'm not here to please me. I'm here to please the church. I'm here to please the Lord. And I, I, I may have to make a, 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 an exception. I may have to just swallow my pride and say, well, that ain't what I would have done. But that's what the church wants to do. And that's what we're going to And there's going to be areas in your Christian walk that you have to do that in uh, a lot of times. Especially... As Paul was talking, when there's talking about these things, about the great areas, or those things are not spelled out in Scripture, you may look at something and say, I don't think that's right. Well, if it doesn't spell it out in Scripture, you may think it's right, and you have that conviction, but don't look down on your brother because he doesn't see it that way. He's not that far along, or maybe you're, you're not that far along. Maybe he's, he's the one that's there. So you just say, I'm, I'm going to pray for him, and I'm not going to let it cause a... a disagreement. I'm going to get mad at my brother because they, they feel this way and I don't feel that way. It's not really spelled out in Scripture. That's what Paul's teaching. Don't have disputations about it. Just agree to disagree. Say, I'm going to live my convictions. You live your convictions. and we're going, we're going to be one big happy family in the Lord and we're going to follow him and build up one another. Because this is what he says. Verse 3, For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. You realize what Christ did? He didn't come into this world to please himself. What did he say? I didn't come into this world to be ministered to, but to minister. He says, I came, and the reproaches that weren't his fell on him. And Christ says this, that he came not to please himself, but to please others and to to please the reproaches, uh, or that the reproaches would follow him. Let, let, me, let me share you this. Philippians chapter 2, everybody knows this scripture, right? 
where it talks about let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. We want to be Christ-like, right? That's what we say, Brother Dalton. I want to, I want to walk with Christ. I want to be Christ-like. So let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Look, in other words, this is what Jesus did. He was in heaven, and he didn't realize he had liberty to be God in heaven. But he didn't hold on to that liberty. Or it says it's not something that he grasped and said, I can't let go of it. He let go of the liberty he had to be God in heaven and came and found himself to be obedient and became a man so that he could experience what you have experienced and what I have experienced. He let go of some things so that he could experience uh, what we go gone through. So we got to let go of some things. We got to take hold of some things. The same thing because if we're going to be Christ-like, then we gotta we got to do like Christ did. You know what Christ did? He gave his life for you and for me. Now, does he ask you to do that? It's a trick question, isn't it? He says die to self. So he does ask us to die, to, to give our lives for, our, for him and for our brothers to, to give up. So many times we, we, we so... I'm going to hold on to this. I'm not going to let that go. It's a conviction that I have. I'm not going to let it go. But then Kyle conviction said, you need to let that go. What we got to do? Got to let it go. We got to let it go when he convicts us of that. There will be some times where he'll come into your life. Things that you uh, last week had complete liberty to do and felt no conviction about it, God will come put on your heart and say, I want you to stop that. So then you have to say, okay, Lord. I'm going to die to self. I'm going to die to myself. Let me tell you a little story about a little boy. There was a little boy that his mom and dad had this very precious vase that was worth tons of money, Brother Dalton. I mean, it was a, a, like a family heirloom. It was from way back, an a ancient little vase. And this kid got his hands stuck down in the vase. And his mama and daddy worked and worked and worked, tried to get that hand out. You know, he couldn't go walk around with a vase on his hand the rest of his life, right? They poured oil down all over it. They put stone dishwashing liquid down on it, and they was trying to pull that thing off, make it slippery and get it off. And they finally decided, we're never getting this off. I mean, they had pulled, worked on it for about an hour. We're never going to get it off. So what do we have to do? Got to break it. Oh, they didn't want to break it. This was a family heirloom. This was something that they, their pawpaw's pawpaw had, amen, that, that, that passed it down. They didn't want to break it. It was priceless to them. But they got to the point where they, they went and found a hammer, and they were just debating. But do we really got to break this thing? They was just about to break it, and the little boy said, do you think it would help if I let go of the piece of candy that's inside this vase? <laughs> he let go of the candy, and his, his hand came right out. That's a funny story, but it's really, it, it applies to us in a lot of ways. How many times are you holding on to something that you think is sweet, that you think is going to make you happy? That's why he kept holding on to that piece of candy, because he thought it was going to make him happy. It was going to be sweet. How many times are you holding on to something that God says, let it go, and you just won't? And it's, it's causing you to be stuck in that place, and you can't really get free, and you can't have liberty, and you can't be filled until you let go of that. Can I say there's a lot of times in our lives where God has something, there's something in our life that God wants us to let go of. He can't fully fill us, and he can't fully uh, indwell us like he wants to and fill us with the Spirit fully until we let those things go. There's some things that all of us have. Listen, I'm... I'll be the first one to tell you, there's some things that I need that God's working on me about. It's a process. I need to let them go. But I, I, you know how I got to do that, though? I got to die to me. I got to quit thinking, well, this is what I want. It doesn't matter what I want. It's what he wants. And he let, tells me to let it go. We got to let it go. So don't keep holding on the things that are going to, that you think is going to fulfill you when really the full fulfillment that we have is when we're filled with the Spirit. What does the Bible say? 
Be not drunk with wine, but be what? Filled with the Spirit. Be not drunk with wine, but be you filled with the Spirit. That's the one thing that God says you can be full of. You can be as drunk as you want to get on the Spirit. And it won't give you a bad taste in your mouth. It won't give you a hangover. It won't make you feel bad. It'll, it'll fulfill you for the, everything that you have. He says, do this. And what, look, verse 4, he says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. What's he mean when he talks about whatever things were written aforetime? He's, right, he's writing to New Covenant, New Testament believers in Rome right now, right? He's talking about the things that were written aforetime. What is he talking about? I believe he's talking about the scriptures, brother, that was written in the Old Testament. Those Old Testament scriptures. How many of y'all ever start reading and say, man, I just I can't get the Old Testament? You know, this is this what, usually what happens. You start in Genesis, and man, Genesis is really good, right? It is a good story. It tells about the creation of the world, and it talks about Abraham, and it talks about Isaac, and it talks about Jacob and all his family. Well, that's good. And then you get into Exodus, and I mean, Exodus is like a movie, right? I mean, it's exciting. It's the, it talks about Pharaoh. It talks about the plagues. It talks about leaving Exodus. And uh, all the miracles that God done talks about crossing the Red Sea, and then you get to Leviticus, and what happens? Wah! You just bog down. Beget, beget, so and so, and so and so, beget, so and so, and I mean, it talks about the law. Don't do this, and don't eat that, and don't say this, and don't do that. Before you know it, you're like, Ugh. I'm going to the New Testament, <laughs> Amen. I'm going to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John because this is just too bad. And I just can't handle it. Let me say this. The Bible just said that everything that was written aforetime was written for our, what? Is written for our learning. It's all there for a reason, y'all. It may be hard to read, and it may not be written to us, but it's written for us. Remember that? That everything in the Bible is not written to you as a Gentile. Some of that is written to the Jews, but it's written for you. You can, you can take it, and you can learn of it, and it can help you. And he says, everything that's written, even the Old Testament, New Testament, is written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the spirits, might have hope. Do you know where you can find more hope than anything? I know somebody may come out running in a, in a uh, election, and they may tag that slogan or something, uh, hope for America or something like that. I remember when Obama ran, he was like, his thing was change, right? He was going to change everything. He did, but it was for the bad, amen? But working, that a politician may promise you hope, but you can't find no hope in, in politics and in, in government. Those things, they can't do anything for you, but where you can find hope is right here. Look what it says. In the comfort through patience and comfort of the spirits, you might find hope. Uh, of the scriptures, you might find hope. I, I, I like it, Brother Dalton, when you can get down and you can pull your Bible out and begin to read it. And I'm talking about you can be upset, having a bad day, and man, it'll just comfort your heart. I remember this one time in particular. It's always stuck out to me. I was a teenager. God was dealing with me about some things. I was saved, but I wasn't where I was supposed to be. Uh, our pastor had left the church that I was attending. And uh, I was kind of lost because that's the only pastor I'd ever knew. I didn't, I, I never knew another pastor. And uh, he was there when, for as long as I can remember. He had left our church and I was just kind of lost. And I was like, what am I, what am I supposed to do? And so I started visiting another church. And that pastor was, was great. Boy, he was doing good, but his preaching was pretty convicting. Man, I was being convicted. And I remember laying in my bed one night, could not go to sleep to save my life. I mean, I tried to count sheep, didn't work. I tried just to count, it didn't work. I tried to do all types of things. I tried to think about anything other, nothing worked, brother. I was laying there, it's about 12, 31 o'clock that night. I'm like, I'm never going to go to bed. And all of a sudden, it's like the Lord impressed upon my heart, get your Bible. I got that Bible out, and I was about 16 years old at the time. I got that Bible out, and I opened it up. 
and I began to read. And I, I, I didn't know where to go or what to do, so I just opened it. Sometimes you can do that. You just open it, and wherever it falls, that's what God wanted you to find. And I remember opening it up and just started reading that night. Man, I've had a, a peace that come about me. I was restless. I had that restless leg syndrome. I was moving, couldn't be still. But I began to read that scripture. And I remember peace come over my heart and over my life. And I, I read for probably 45 minutes, 30 minutes, 45 minutes. Didn't, I didn't have a whole Bible study, but I just re read. And after I got done reading, I prayed. And when I laid my head down on the pillow, that's the last thing I remember my head hitting the pillow. And I was asleep, and I had a good night's sleep. But it brought me peace and comfort of the scriptures. It probably wasn't Leviticus. I don't think I opened up to Leviticus. Amen. I'm pretty sure I went to the New Testament that night. Amen. But it did. It gave me peace and comfort and uh, also hope. Verse 5 says, Now the God of patience and consolation grants you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus. So we are to be all one of one accord like-minded. Do y'all know God's people are to be the ones that, that are on the same page? We need to be on the same page about what God wants us to do. That's the failing of a lot of churches. They're not on the same page. There's certain factions that want to do things this way and certain factions that want to do things that way and certain groups that get mad about this and certain groups that none of them's united. But when you have unity and peace amongst the brethren... Uh, God can do all kind of things. And listen, that's what we've seen here. Can I say that? That's what we've seen. That we've been, had unity. But be aware of this. I, I can tell you, I can just stand back and look and see. Satan hadn't been able to attack us from the inside, okay? We're all pretty united on what, we're, what our goal is, what we're going, what we're doing, our worship. And he hadn't been able to attack us right here. But I tell you what he has been able to do. He's hitting us from the outside. From all different places that I can probably name you 25 different places. I see the devil trying to, to start something in our church, do something in our church, because he doesn't like what's going on here. But we got to be of the same mind and of the same spirit that we continue to do what God would have us to do. And uh, we can be like-minded one to another according to Christ. Verse 6, that you may... With one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus. Look at this next verse. Wherefore receive ye one another, as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Can I say something? If we get nothing else tonight, we need to get this verse. Let me read it to you again. Wherefore receive ye one another, as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Receive ye one another, just like Christ received us. You know what he's talking about there? How did Christ receive you? Did, there you go. Just as I am. In other words, Christ didn't come to you and look at your life and take inventory of your life and say, well, I'll accept you when you get this, this, and that right. He didn't do that, did he? What did he do? He accepted you. Just like you was, just as you am, just as you are. He, he, he didn't come to you and say, I want you to get this fixed and get this fixed. I've, I've had so many conversations with people who say, well, when I get this area of my life right, I'm going to come to church. You know what I'm telling you? I'll never come to church because you ain't going to never get it right. Oh, I can do it. Well, you may can, but the devil's going to throw a wrench in your plans every time you get almost there where you think you're good enough to come to church. Just come like you are. And listen. There's going to be some folks that walk through that door back there, and we're going to have to receive them just like they are. I've been in places before where people walk in the door, and they didn't look just like everybody else, and they just kind of turned their nose up at them. Oh, I don't know about them folks. No, that's not how God, he says, receive others like God received us. Blow down, dirty, sinful, amen, Uh they may be full of sin. They may be some folks that walk through the door. And they may have alcohol smell on their breath. You know what we got to do? We got to love them and show them the right way. Don't, just, don't, don't kick them out and say, oh, you're not welcome here. No, you got to receive them just like God received you. And just love them. Listen, if you'll love them and God gets a hold of them, he'll change them. It ain't no matter what you say. That ain't going to change a whole lot of people. God will change somebody, amen? But if you'll love somebody just like they are, 
and say, hey, listen, we're just going to love you. It doesn't mean that we condone it. It doesn't mean that we say we're okay with that. But we love you, and we want you to meet Jesus because Jesus is the one that can, can make a difference in your life. That's what we've got to do. So that may be what happens. But he says, receive you one another. In other words, uh, you, don't, you don't clean your fish, or you don't ask your fish to be clean before you catch them, right? You catch them, and then you clean them. So that's the same way we are to receive people, the same way. We just need to, to, to receive them, love them, let Christ clean them and change their lives to the glory of God. Now, if you get nothing else today, I want you to get that. I want you to understand that. There you go. Just think about how, how, how he was. He was killing Christians, right? And he thought, listen, this is the thing. He thought he was doing God a favor until God came in and said, shine that light on his heart and said, Saul, Saul, why is thou persecutest thou me? And uh, he changed his life, right? He changed his life. Uh, I, I just wanted to be the one in the, in the church. Listen, could you imagine Paul or Saul of Tarsus walking in the church house that day when... Uh, I mean, that would be like us today, Osama bin Laden walking through that back door right here. I'm, I'm serious. I'm talking about if Osama bin Laden would have got born again and stuff, that been like him walking through the door saying, hey, I'm going to go to church, y'all, because I got saved and got born again. What do you think most of us would have did? Oh, we would have went crazy, wouldn't we? But Paul did that. He walked up in that door, a changed man. And they received him. Uh, I know there was a lot of them that, that probably kept him out of distance till they could understand and see if he wasn't going to try to trick them and kill them, but they received him. So he took them just like they are. Verse 8, Now I say that Christ Jesus was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. And what he said, that he first came to the Jew. Do you realize through all the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the book of Acts, it talks about to the Jew what? First. Right. Because that's who he was came to. So the circumcision is just another uh, word for a Jew. That's, a, that's what they did. That was their sign. That was their, their uh, how they associated with God. And he said that Jesus was a minister to the Jew for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. He said he was come just to confirm to them that everything their fathers had said about his coming was coming true. <laughs> And that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, as it is written, For this cause will I will confess to thee among the Gentiles, and sing unto my, thy name. And again, he said, Rejoice, ye Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and laud him, all you people. And again, Isaiah, as Isaiah says, There shall be a root of Jesse, and that he shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, and him and in him shall the Gentiles trust. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy, peace, and believing that you may be abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Look what he says here. He was a minister to the Jew first to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. That's what he came to do. That's his miracles were to confirm the promises that God made to the, the fathers of old. And the Gentiles may glorify God for his mercy. Do you know what would have happened if they would have received him? If he would have came, the Bible says he came into his own and his own received him not. Well, what if they would have received him? <laughs> they would have, the, the, the kingdom would have been set up right then, right? God would have set up his kingdom. And then he would have, I, I'm not sure if he would have reached out to us. But listen, because they rejected him. Then he went to the Gentiles, or his gospel was spread to the Gentiles by, by men named Paul. So listen, it's hard for me to understand how they did. I mean, they had every prophecy about him coming, where he was going to come, how he was going to come. And he came just exactly like the prophecy said. So I'm sitting here thinking, how in the world could they not accept him? But boy, I'm glad they didn't. Amen. I'm glad that God blinded their eyes because of them. We have an op opportunity to come to know Jesus You've had an opportunity to come to know Jesus, and because of that, we can glorify God for that through this. Anybody got any questions tonight before we, before we dismiss? 
I went super long a few nights ago, so I'm going to let you out a little bit early tonight. Uh, but what I want to do, if, if nobody's got any questions, if you get nothing else, get this tonight. Uh, not old folks class, I'm glad y'all are in here tonight, amen, glad y'all were with us. Uh, but get this, receive ye one another as Christ also received us. Do you realize this? God took us how we were, but he loved us enough he didn't let us stay in that place. Listen to that. He took us how we was, but he loved us so much he didn't let us stay there. So receive your brother, just like they are, but love them enough that you're not going to let them stay there. You're going to show them the truth. You're going to be a good witness to them. You're going to tell them about Jesus and what he can do for them, but don't let them stay there. Um, if somebody come in that door with a smell of beer or alcohol on their breath, I would love them, but I'd tell them what the Bible says about it and tell them how that drunkenness is, is an, an affliction to God, and God is against drunkenness. If somebody came in and caught up in an immoral sin, I would love them in that immoral sin. But I tell them what the Bible said about the truth, how that's not how God wants us to live. That's not God's design for us. So accept people, but don't love them enough not to let them stay there. You might got any questions? I hadn't heard that, I don't think. What's that verse, brother? We're in Acts chapter 17, brother um, um, Chuck Missler always says, he uses that verse. I'm looking for it right here. But it talks about that, to, to be, not to take my word for it, but to check it out for yourself every day. I'll tell you a quick story and we're going to dismiss. I remember preaching not too many years ago when I was here. And I, I preached about the Holy of Holies and how the priest would go in the Holy of Holies and they'd tie a rope to the to the priest's ankle. That way, if he wasn't right with God, he'd fall out dead. They could drag him out. Nobody would have to go in. When I got done with that, a fellow come up to me. And he said, hey, I'm not trying to be critical, but can you tell me where that's at in the Bible? He said, I, I, I've heard people preach that all my life. I've never been able to find where it said that in the Bible. And you know what I had to say? I don't know because I just heard people say that too, and I was passing on other, I was passing on what I heard. But you know what? Not in there. You know what? I've never preached again. <laughs> I've never preached that again. But what I'm saying, you're right. Sometimes we take things that people say and, and it, it's not in there. So we got to check it out. I wish I could find that verse. It's Acts chapter 17. Uh, one of them um, talks about, it may be 22, 17. But um, talks about check it all out and uh, know for yourself. Um what the Bible says, and don't don't take it. Don't take your preacher's word for it. Don't take don't take what your you, your Sunday school teacher says. Check it out for yourself, and 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 see, and then you'll know. Amen. Yeah, he did. He absolutely did. Teacher, he was as good a one as there was. Yeah. All right. Yeah, they, they, they checked it out and made sure everything was right. I was thinking. Uh, I wish I I wish I could find it. It's it's in chapter seventeen somewhere, but I just don't know exactly where it is. But uh anyway, uh th thank you for being here tonight. Y'all be much in prayer for all of your prayer requests we remembered tonight and then looking forward to church on Sunday. Hey look, do y'all realize it's almost Easter?
So I got to wrap up my Are You Ready series this week. So y'all really pray for me this week, okay? So I got to cover Armageddon and the millennial reign and all that kind of stuff. And I don't know how I'm going to do it in one week. <laughs> I, yes. Verse 11. 17, verse 11. There you go. And search the scriptures daily whether those things were so. That's exactly right. Verse 11. Thank you. So y'all go to really say Yeah, but y'all pray for me. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'm gonna, I, I got to get it done uh, this week. A unless we're going to come back after Easter and, and, and finish it up. I, I got to let you out every once in a while. <laughs> I can tell you this, after Brother Mike was here the other day, y'all appreciate me, amen. <laughs> Let's stand to our feet. Let's do this tonight. We're going to do something a little different. Uh, Miss Jennifer and Brother Jason, if y'all would come forward. Miss Jennifer and Brother Jason has asked us to pray over them tonight and just pray over their family. So this is what I want you to do. If you're able to come, would y'all just come up to the altar? Y'all can bow down on your, on your knees right there. We're just going to lay hands on them and pray. The Bible says if there's anything afflicting you, if you're sick, if you have any kind of troubles, they're calling the elders of the church and asking them to pray. 